your conversation. I think there's been some great discussion at the tables and uh, in a moment I'm going to invite you up maybe uh, one table at a time. Perhaps there's uh, one idea from your table that you'd be willing to share. I do want to just take a little bit of a, a, a sideline for a moment and just talk about um, the new opportunity that we have in our district for the grants. I don't know how many of you are able to go online with that seminar on Tuesday night. But we have been able to provide an opportunity for clubs that do not have charitable status to issue tax receipts. So if you find yourself in that situation, and, and this came from lots of clubs across our district that were frustrated that they couldn't issue tax receipts for cash donations. So we as a district were able to talk to the Calgary Foundation who is happy to partner with clubs to provide that opportunity and the, the webinar that we did on Tuesday night has been saved and it has been saved to our district website. So if you have a moment to take a look at that, uh, that's certainly a worthwhile resource to look at. Um, in a nutshell, the Calgary Foundation will create an account for each club individually your donation would go through the Calgary Foundation. They would charge 1% of the gift is the expense to your club. They would issue the tax receipt directly to the person who had provided the cash donation and you're well on your way to your fundraising efforts. This of course does have to follow CRA guidelines and rule, rules, not guidelines, rules. Um, as, as any other charitable entity has to do that. So there are qualified donees. It, it, can't be, um, it can't be a situation where you're fundraising to raise money for your club to do something that's not uh, in a registered charitable in, environment, if you will. If you're having a golf tournament and you're raising money to buy pediatric beds at the hospital, perfect situation. If you're having a golf tournament to raise money to um, provide club funds so that you can take those funds and and do something with them, send kids to camp, I don't know, whatever your project is, maybe not so much. But just keep that in mind as you're planning your year that this opportunity now exists for all clubs in our district. I know that some centers including you know Lethbridge and others have local foundations and I would encourage you to talk to those people and see if they are able to provide your Rotary Club with the same opportunity. Uh, the Calgary Foundation is an opportunity, it's another alternative and the Calgary Foundation is, is completely supportive of you going to your local foundation if that'll work for your club. So please check that out, okay? Just a little bit of a sideline. Just yes, just Pat. For clarity, yes. If you have a golf tournament and you charge an entry fee, that isn't something that can be passed up. Correct. It's only if you get donations after the event, right? So I think the, the, way that I, I, the way that I understand it is let's say you charge 200 bucks for your golf tournament, and let's say that 50 bucks goes towards paying for your food, and 150 bucks of the 200 is your cash donation to your fundraiser. That $150 can be tax receipted, not the full 200 okay, just to be clear. And again, uh, in that scenario, if you're raising money for purchasing beds at the local hospital, the hospital would be a, a registered, don't, uh, certified recipient of those funds, so the cash receipt would certainly happen, okay? Any, any other questions on that before we go on to your ideas? Mary? Clear? Yes. Correct, correct, Barry, yeah. Correct, so, so in, let's go back to our golf tournament scenario. Golf tournament costs $200. When the person comes to pay for your golf tournament, they're going to write a check for 50 bucks to the Rotary Club of Olds, and then they're going to write a check for 150 bucks to the Calgary Foundation. And then the treasurer or some designated in, individual at the Rotary Club of Olds will make a spreadsheet, and they'll have a list of, 200 golfers that paid $150, that all goes to the Calgary Foundation. All of those 200 golfers each get a tax receipt for 150 bucks, and then the other $50 goes to the Rotary Club of Olds to pay the caterer for the lunch. Makes. What's that, Pat? 
Well, or, you know, whatever. Maybe it's 20 bucks for lunch, and I, I mean, you know, the numbers aren't correct. It's just, a, it's just a, you know, I'm not a treasurer. I'm not a finance person. So, anyways, it gives you, the, it gives you the, the, the idea of how you could make it work. I mean, not, so let's say your fundraiser isn't to completely go towards raising money for that pediatric bed. Maybe you want 50 bucks of the golf tournament to go to the pediatric bed, and you want 50 bucks to go into your Rotary Club account. You can, you can set it up whichever way works for you, okay? You can take that 200 bucks and give 50 bucks to the, the hospital and 50 bucks to the, to the um, you know, the club, whatever. Yes? So the Calgary Foundation would receive the money and they issue the tax receipt and then they in turn take 1% from that $150 gift and then they forward that check with a cover letter to the hospital that says the Rotary Club of Olds gratefully provides X amount of dollars towards your pediatric bed purchase. So we're, we're taking the money, we're putting it into the Calgary Foundation with a designated path of where we want that money to go. If you had a long-term project, in Olds we're building an athletic park for $500,000, it's going to take us a while to get there. We could open this account at the Calgary Foundation, have the golf tournament scenario, have that $100 go into the Calgary Foundation and have it sit there until we want them to write a check. Let's say every year we want a check from the Calgary Foundation to go to the town of Olds to pay towards that athletic park. And we, we just designate, when we set the account up with the Calgary Foundation, we say, okay, we want this money designated for this fundraiser. And it flows through them, so they issue the tax receipt, they look after the reporting to CRA, they look after all of the administration that's involved in charitable organizations and receding and documentation. They do all of that for that 1% fee. And it's a 1% fee that's only charged every time a gift is received. There's no other fees. There's no minimum requirement for donations. It's, uh, it's a pretty awesome opportunity for us, particularly for those of us who don't have that charitable status. There's only seven clubs in our district that have that ability to issue tax receipts. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the video. If you have any questions, call Janine Webb. Her name and everything's on the video. She's at the Calgary Foundation, and she's more than happy to meet with people and, and set it up for you. Okay? I, I just want to move on. I don't, to. All right, let's, let's hear from you guys. I want to hear what your ideas are and how you're going to roll them out. So if we have any volunteers in the group, come on up. You guys need to come up and tell us about your situation that you've got going on. So come on up. You're going to be on Facebook Live, so you can come and stand where I'm standing, and I want to hear about your, your plans and your successes so far because you guys are doing amazing things in Pitcher Creek. So come on over. You're going to be on Facebook Live. <laughs> well, Oak Cliff was in really bad shape, and so <laughs> we thought if we if we want a, re a revival of our club, we need something big, and and so we looked into what the needs were in the community, and um, then we came up with this plan, like a revival for Main Street, and we think if this can attract the attention of of the residents, then. We will, we will be able to gather more members. So it's, we're trying to have a win-win. And so David is, is working on it. So, so um, I'm riding on Hélène's coattails <laughs> because she has been the tenacious uh, promoter and leader of this idea. And what I love about it is it's, it's a big idea. It's a big vision. It, has to do with um, trying to revitalize our downtown and and th so there's a lot of thinking that's been going on around you know what makes a community work and uh, what our community in particular needs or could could 
benefit from. And one big idea is, is a huge indoor space with lots of natural sunlight and some greenery and uh, which which is you know f filling a need that's uh, in Pincher in my view which is a, a public gathering space um, in addition to our co-op which is kind of on the outskirts of town and the Walmart both of which you know do go some way to fill that need but uh, they're quite limited and, and my vision for the future is a pedestrian downtown and we're hoping that it will encourage some retail to come and uh, and then the, the final part of it is the co-housing idea which is uh, in creating an intentional community, kind of like a neighborhood, with a whole range of age groups and family types um, that would be mutually supporting. So this, I think the, the, you know, the most pronounced need here is for individuals, couples uh, who have um, whose kids are gone, this is one example, whose kids are gone or maybe one spouse has died and the person doesn't want to manage a house on their own but they're not quite ready to move into a, a seniors or assisted living facility and they want to still be part of the community. So the idea is that uh, these, these different family types and age groups would be mutually complementary and you know kids profit from being around their grandparents or uh, people in 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 that age group and vice versa you know seniors want to be around young people and uh you know it, it it reproduces that natural order of things so it's it's really a credit to elen that uh, she's pulled this idea forward <clears throat> and um that you're doing the work well I'm, I'm i'm helping and i'm happy to do it and it's it's pretty easy thing to step into in a way and and the encouraging part of it is that there's actually been some excitement in the community around this idea um so so far so good thank you thank you awesome anyone else who else come on up Facebook Live is all yours, sir. Say your name. Uh, Bill Maines, incoming co-president-elect for Lethbridge East. Um, and I'm sitting at a table with incoming for two other clubs in Lethbridge. So we all know each other in the city. We're kind of one big family of cousins down here. Um, but we were talking about the projects that we had and what kind of came out of the project is like, how do you find a project? How do you get the passion for the project? How do you make it succeed? And what it really does, in our opinion, was it boils down that you've got one person that has a dream. And let that person bring the other people on. So downtown club, Lethbridge, Rotary Club of Lethbridge, you've got uh, the girls' school in Africa has been a passion, and they've been doing it. and they. The rest of us helpful from time to time with that, but there's one guy was the driver for it. The hydroelectric project that they have in Nepal, one guy was the driver for it and had passion that he developed after being in Nepal. Um, Sunrise Club, they send fire trucks and ambulances to Mexico every year. Um, and there was one or two guys had a passion for it and they have that passion and they bring their club in. Our club, we, we, uh, we built a hospital in India one guy had a passion for it, and the rest of the club came. We, uh, we just finished an IT project in Dominican Republic. One guy had a passion and brought the others in, and that one was a little unique that there were lots of tasks that could be done in Alberta, so we had some a work bee night, so everybody felt that they were part of it. And then we sent a team, and people went with that one. And uh, we just started our second year with developing an ag scholarship to, to 
build leadership in the future in um, in agriculture, kind of it's a continuation of all our other youth projects. And again, one guy had the passion for it and he got the other people. And so when you look at our committee, it's actually the one guy with the passion and a whole bunch of wannabe farm kids that left the farm. But anyhow, <laughs> bottom line is listen to your passionate people that have a passion for something. And not everybody has to have the passion, but one person with the passion will bring the other people on to help get it executed and make it successful. Thank you. Marlis? Oh, I just want to talk to you after. Okay. Anyone, anyone else want to share? Come on up. Mandy DeCheco Colababa. I want to just um, kind of expand on what Bill said. Our club this year did something totally different for our local project. And instead of it being one person's passion, we decided to engage the whole club by getting people's outside passion of Rotary involved so that maybe it would be something that we would donate to on a bigger scale. So we put everybody's name in a hat and we drew for leaders. Those leaders got a team of 10 people from our club. That leader got to pick one of their passion projects. They get a check for $2,000 from the club and they have 10 people to go and volunteer two hours at their passion project. And so it's gotten a whole bunch of people engaged that wouldn't normally be engaged. It's creating fellowship. And then at the end of the year, we have 12 places that we volunteered at that we will give a presentation back to the club and see if we want to maybe expand our local project at a larger capacity at one of those places, because now we've been there, we've seen what they need, or if we want to keep giving and spending our time and our money at all of these places, different places for the next 12 months. So it's been interesting because so far we've seen people in pictures and volunteering that have been active members for a long time, but we don't really see them engaging at the club level. And now they're coming and going to these events because they are part of a team and it's they're picked to go and do it and it's really engaging our club again. So sometimes it's good to get that passion from outside too and it not always being driven by one person for engagement. All right, thanks, Mandy. I'm going to move on now, but I think that maybe we could even take some time at lunch and we can share some more because the sharing part is just so valuable and I'd like to have some time to do a little bit more of that if we could. All right, so I think the main thing is as president or as part of the leadership of your club, you need to really listen to the members in your team. You need to, you know, like, the, like they always say, you, you listen with two ears and speak with one mouth. Uh, make sure that you're providing clear communication to your group so that everyone knows it, knows what's happening. Um, you can certainly do that through a newsletter, through the calendar on your club runner, through Facebook, whatever way you communicate your message to your membership. Uh, it's a good idea to keep everybody in the loop. So, you know, even if you're not at a Rotary Club meeting this week, you missed a meeting, you can still be involved in, in what's happening at your club level. Uh, recognize those accomplishments of your club members. Volunteers love support. They need support, and, and make sure that you as a leadership team are providing that support to the volunteers in your organization. Uh, remember to motivate your club members and to encourage them when they're reaching their goals. Uh, this is also very important to recognize the hard work that people are putting into these activities and initiatives. Again, listen to your members and ensure that their needs and their passions are met. How many times do you induct a new member and part of the induction goes, so what's your passion? Why were you here? Why did you join Rotary? And then you go on and you do your rotary things and then that person with that passion suddenly doesn't come anymore and it's kind of fallen off the wagon. Keep tabs with those passionate people and why they're there. We all are in rotary for a reason and we need to make sure that that reason is explored and motivated and encouraged and fulfilled to keep that rotary spark going. All right, so rotary moment. Some of us have them, some of us don't.
Some of us are new at this game. Some of us have been more seasoned members. But if you have a rotary moment, great. Talk about it, share it, tell the stories. If you don't have one, steal one from somebody else. And you know, this is what storytelling is all about. You know, you hear a story, you motivate the story, you retell the story, but it's engaging the club. It's keeping everybody excited about what Rotary's doing locally and globally. We're changing lives. It's exciting, the work that Rotary's doing, and it creates that buzz in the room. And it creates that ability to think open-mindedly and to think about the potential and the possibilities. Um, remember to have fun and to try new things and to respect other people's ideas. Don't shut people down when they have a new thought. Try and encourage that thought because you never know where it might go. You know, open your minds to, to new ideas and new possibilities and, and you have no idea what things might happen as a result of that being open-minded and encouraging. I don't know how, lots of you may, actually most of you probably remember Popeye back in the day when he was a, a figure on television, Popeye and his spinach. Um, yeah, maybe some of you don't, I don't know. This would be a moment of whatever you call that when you sing without music. Acapella? Acapella? Popeye song? Popeye. Popeye you don't know Popeye? No. Oh, Popeye the Sailor Man? You know, there you go. <laughs> anyway, we segue. <laughs> um, this is all about your energy to lead. And I think, um, I know as, as Martin has said in the past, when, when he speaks, he's an amazing individual. And, and uh, the energy to lead and the energy to do new things is, is important. You need to stay on top of your health. You need to make sure that that you're delegating things to others and you're staying as organized as you can. Um, keep members informed of what's happening and ask for help. If you find that you're feeling a little overwhelmed, there's lots of people in the room that are willing and able and just waiting for you to ask for their help. So I think that's been a lesson I've learned in Rotary in my journey that um, there's lots of people around that want to see you succeed. So don't hesitate to ask for help. Your past president is a huge resource and all of those other past presidents in your club, make use of them. They have knowledge and experience that, that uh, can help you in your journey, in your leadership role. Call on others for help, your, your AGs, your assistant governors in the room. Uh, we have a whole bunch of new committees at the district level. They're more than happy to, to help you with your project or with, with whatever's going on that you might need some help with. So, so don't hesitate to reach out for that support and uh, just keep smiling because, you know, it's all good for Rotary, right? All right, I have like almost finished. All right, so the top five things uh, I'd like to share with you. When I was president, um, there were a couple of things that I look back after my year and these are some of the things that I, I wish I'd known or wish I'd done when I was president. I wish I had a monthly schedule of what things needed to be done, both at the club level and at the district level. And if you look in your, your booklets there that uh, Rick Eisted printed for us, we as a district team got together and we put a calendar together for you. So at the back of your booklet, there's a, a calendar that's d d uh, divided into different months. Of the, of the rotary year and it kind of gives you a bit of a framework to use when you're planning things. Things like when your memorandum of understanding needs to be sent into the district. Things like when is the grants webinar in October that you need to all be participatory in and other important deadlines throughout our Rotary calendar. So, so do take some time later to, to look at that and plug them into your phone or whatever you want to do to just stay on top of those dates so that you're well organized and prepared in your club planning. Become more familiar with our district resources. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with our district website. If you're not yet, I would encourage you to spend some time there. It's a huge resource. 
Uh, lots of really good things happening in our district. It does take a little bit of time to, to work your way through it, but do take the time. Uh, we do have an admin assistant whose paid position is at the in Calgary. Charlene Bearden is her name. Charlene is a wonderful resource to help you with just about anything under the sun. Don't hesitate to call her. She's expecting your call. That's her job is to help us do the work of Rotary. So please make sure that you have her number in your toolkit. Um, strategic plan, something that, that all clubs should think about. Uh, you don't need to call it a strategic plan. You can call it a goal. But when you're coming into your leadership in your new Rotary year, we've talked a little bit about what your passions are for your, your time to have the baton. Make some plans and, and make it happen and be strategic about how you're going to roll out that plan for your club. Have more fun social activities. I didn't do enough of that when I was president. I was so busy trying to make sure the administration and the everything else happened that I kind of neglected that fun part. So make sure that you have fun. It's going to be work, uh, no doubt about it, but have fun, like, you know, it, enjoy the ride. And just do more delegation of duties to boards and committees. Uh, let's face it, we're not Superman, and um, we need to be able to share the load because it's important that you do. And, and you know what? Someone chose you for this role, and now it's the time to mentor others to have that succession planning and leadership. So make sure that you provide opportunities for others to take on that leadership role in your club as you soon will be yourself. All right, so just to end, always remember the power of a simple smile, a helpful hand and a listening ear and a kind word. I found this um, in Australia when we were down at the district, at the Rotary International Conference and it just really resonated with me. And um, for those of you who've never been president, it's a role that I would have to say is going to be your best year ever. And I would like to widen that comment to say that when you're in leadership in your club, it's, it's an amazing opportunity and I think you'll find it to be your best year ever because that's certainly been my experience. And I commend you all for taking the baton, for taking the torch for your club and for our district. And I really appreciate your, what you're doing for Rotary and uh, well done, doing awesome. Thank you. I am, and I'm like right on the minute. Right on. Whew. So um, we're going to take a break in just a minute, but Bill, Bill encouraged me to share a passion that I have that I would like your feedback on. If you, if you think this is a good idea, I'd like to hear it. If you think there's a better way to do it or you think it's a bad idea, I'd like to hear that. Okay? How I came about this was for my work on with uh, volunteering with the Victim Services Unit. My role with volunteering is not a major role. I write checks and I get grants and that kind of thing. But the advocates who do that work, they are like my heroes, right? Because the stuff they have to deal with is like horrendous. So as an example, um, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, uh, Sergeant Henry might call up Adonis, one of our advocates, and say, Adonis, you gotta meet me at the hospital. And so the Adonis, you know, goes to the hospital and she meets mom and she meets five-year-old Timmy. And mom observed dad raping five-year-old Timmy. I mean, I don't know how much worse situations get than that. So Adonis, her role then is to help Timmy kind of recover, build some resilience, build, you know, stop that from occurring again, and then move forward to get past that, right? So it's huge, huge work that it takes. And good thing that there's Adonis and other people who are involved in that kind of role to reduce adverse childhood experiences. This experience of, of Timmy getting raped by his father, that's like one of 10 adverse childhood experiences. The, and it's not the, the one thing, it's how many of those things you have. The more of these ACEs that you have, the, the more likely, almost certain, that your life is gonna have poor health, that you are gonna die early, that these are like the way it works. 
there's a strong probability that, that Timmy is going to be, become an addict, that Timmy is going to be get engaged in a life of crime, that Timmy won't be able to be a good parent, that Timmy won't be able to be a good employee, that Timmy won't be able to be a good citizen, right? Those are, those are the things. So bad, crappy life, die young. So very, very sad. But with Adonis's intervention and with other people who care about doing that and about enhancing these childhood experiences, what could happen? The path that Timmy's life takes could be substantially different, right? It could be like a normal childhood that we've all had where, you know, you, you, you're able to be productive, you're able to learn, you're able to be a good employee, you're able to be a good business person, you're able to be a good citizen, right? You have no need for drugs in your life, right? Life is good, you're happy, you live a long life, you're a good parent, and you die happy. That's, that's kind of the, where that path can change. And a lot of the interventions are super small, little things. So they're just like, in that example with Timmy, keep Timmy away from dad. That's a pretty straightforward type thing. So that's not going to happen again, right? And then have the conversation with Timmy that, Timmy, this is not your fault, right? This is not, you know, you didn't do anything to deserve this because the literature says that's what happens. That the child believes that they're at fault, they somehow caused it which is sad, right? But that's the reality of it. Years later, maybe for their whole life, they think that they're the one that is at fault. And so that's very sad. So my, it's not a project, it's an area of focus that improving those childhood experiences or reducing those adverse childhood experiences is really important. So it's important for Timmy and Sarah and Billy and these kids, it's important for them, but also it's important for our society, our community, right? If we've got more people who are able to contribute, more people that want to give back, more people that have happy, healthy lives, that's a good thing. Addiction, the literature says, goes down 75%. Crime related to that addiction goes down 75%. So we're helping the individual, but we're helping our community. So I'm a big advocate of spending some time and energy on that. I'm gonna do it personally, like I'm doing this anyways, I'm committed, but I would love others to, if they share that same vision, to help me with that, okay? So that got a little heavy, I apologize, but that's, that's the situation. So now, it is 9.45 right on time, let us take a break and uh, mingle, have some coffee, and we're gonna start in what, 15 minutes, Marlis? 10 o'clock, we'll be right back at it, thank you.